Right, so welcome along, ladies and gentlemen, to your weekly SETI seminar series. Today, we're very lucky to be joined by Sarah Ballard, who's come across to us from uh, MIT, uh, where she's uh, doing a postdoc at the moment. Uh, Sarah uh, actually did a, uh, an RU program um, back in 2006 at uh, CFA. Uh, and then in 2007, she uh, did her uh, BS at, uh, at UC Berkeley, uh, where she uh, majored in astrophysics and uh, and studied the spectra of elliptical galaxies. And in 2012, she did her PhD at Harvard. Uh, she was working with Dave Charbonneau, and that's when she got into exoplanets. Uh, she was using uh, the epoxy mission, data from the epoxy mission, Spitzer and uh, Kepler, to look at uh, different exoplanets and the properties of exoplanets. Uh, and then she um, did a postdoc with uh, Eric Agol at uh, Washington University, uh, where she first uh, looked at uh, small stars and exoplanets around small stars and M-dwarfs. Um, and then in 2015, last year, she got a, a postdoc position um, where she's become a Taurus Fellow at MIT, uh, working with Josh Wynn. Um, and uh, that's where she is currently, and she's going to talk to us about her research in exoplanets and different ways to look at exoplanet research. So please join me in welcoming Sarah. Can, can you hear me? Yeah. Great. Uh, thank you all so much for coming. I know here at the SETI um, talk series, you probably hear a lot about exoplanets. And indeed, if you're in the field of exoplanets right now, it's completely different than it was 10 years ago. It used to be the type of field when I was entering it where you could count the number of at least transiting exoplanets on one or two hands. And now there's just thousands upon thousands of them. So in the time that I have, I hope to describe what I see as sort of a judicious combination of approaches when it comes to studying exoplanets. It's no longer the case, even with all of the resources at humanity's disposal, that we could meaningfully follow up every planet we now know exists around another star. So those are precious resources, and we have to spend them carefully. And then this whole field has opened up of ensemble studies of exoplanets. Let me uh, describe some of the questions I would like folks um, to have answered by the end of this talk. The first is how common are exoplanets? You've probably already had a sense for this, even from reading the news, sort of public osmosis, that exoplanets are not rare. It's probably something which has, um, you know, it's the first part of any elevator speech I give. Do you know how common planets are? Um, but also, are most of the planets in the Milky Way orbiting stars like the sun, or are they dissimilar to the sun? Um, that particular question about so-called eta Earth, the rate of planets the size of Earth orbiting stars like the sun, that's anchored uh, studies of exoplanets um, from when I can remember. And I, I do feel that that question is materially shifting to another kind of star altogether. And I'll describe why that's so. And then when you're talking not just about individual planets, but in terms of architectures of planetary systems, how good is the solar system at furnishing a blueprint to the types of planetary systems that we see. And moreover, can you describe systems of planets using just one model that looks like the solar system? And I'll describe how, how we do that. And then I'll close with kind of a look forward. So if you're in the field of exoplanets like me, um, I remember being a student, and it was hard to forecast maybe what would be interesting and most exciting, even months in the future. And it's only with PhD training and becoming you know, more and more incrementally senior in the field of exoplanets that I get a taste for what things are going to be exciting in five years or 10 years. And to that end, I want to answer this question. Um, when am I going to see the detection of a molecule of another Earth on the front page of the San Francisco Chronicle? And I'm going to take a guess at that. I don't know the answer. Um, but I'm going to take what I think is a pretty educated guess. So I'm going to anchor this talk at several points in the solar system itself. So like any Earthling, I ought to think first about where I came from when I think about studying potential life on other worlds, which means studying potential other worlds, which means studying other stars. And I want to start with my own star. So this is a beautiful, I think, image uh, taken from 2012. It's of our own home star and it shows the transit of Venus. You can see that Venus passing in front of our star is actually not the only dynamic feature of this movie taken by NASA's Solar Dynamics Observatory. You can actually see a hint of our star rotating 
and it rotates about once a month. And moreover, you can also see these beautiful features which are corresponding to the roiling surface of our star, its magnetic activity. And yet, even if you didn't have this beautifully resolved movie, you still could infer the presence of Venus, even if all of these pixels were reduced to a single pixel and you were looking at something hundreds of light years away, even thousands of light years away, you could infer that the planet was there because our star would look some fraction periodically dimmer every time Venus was silhouetted against its surface and blocked some of that light from reaching the silicon eye of the detector. So you've probably heard about the transit method before. Um, and it was uh, newish uh, when I was a graduate student. So in 2007, I was just starting my studies at Harvard as a PhD student. And this was the half of the sum total of our knowledge about planets that transited other stars. So at that point, there was 100 or so exoplanets uh, in addition, maybe a few hundred, that have been detected using other methods. Transit was relatively new. And you can see that the sample looks relatively homogeneous. These are mostly sun-like stars. This is showing to scale the planet projected on the surface of the star. Almost all of them look like uh, Jupiter, roughly the size of Jupiter. And you can see that there's this one planet at the bottom, which was the single known transiting hot Neptune. And anyone who was anyone at that time was studying this one hot Neptune, GJ436, anyone who was anyone in ex observational exoplanets, I guess. Um, and you can see what a tiny planet it appears to be, even Neptune, four times the size of Earth, but projected against a very small star indeed. This is one of the first hints that we were getting that it's not only stars like the Sun that host planets. And all of that knowledge, which was coming in kind of crumbs at that period of time, we began to feast once NASA's Kepler mission was launched. It's easy to describe, relatively speaking, how this mission functioned. It was a single silicon eye, and it affixed its gaze on a part of the sky, which is overhead at around midnight uh, right now. It's about the size of your outstretched hand um, when held at the end of your arm. And within that field, so I'm showing here the Kepler field of view, um, which you can kind of see. It's, it's full of stars, and because of bandwidth constraints, this was a, a mission that was trailing behind the Earth. We could only really look at um, 150,000 of them and really monitor their brightness. And, and this figure shows what's almost the sum total of our knowledge of the existence of transiting exoplanets in this part of the sky prior to the launch of Kepler. So there's one hot Jupiter uh, around the star Tres II. And that was what we knew. And as of 2013, uh, this were, these were the locations of the transiting exoplanets that Kepler had uncovered by virtue of the fact that they were blocking some of the starlight of their stars. Dennis Overby of the New York Times referred to this as the Skittles diagram, and that's kind of stuck, I think. Um, and those Skittles uh, hopefully are conveying a few things. It's not only the ubiquity of exoplanets, it's kind of starting to hint at something which I want to convey, which is that at that period of time before Kepler was launched, we wondered whether exoplanets weren't intrinsically rare because the rate of hot Jupiters around sun-like stars is something like 1%. But in fact, Jupiter-sized things, which are depicted here with red dots, are actually intrinsically rare in those short orbits. They were the lowest of the low-hanging fruit. And all of those planets were just slightly higher on the tree, waiting to be picked by a mission in space. This is showing an animation um, by a current graduate student at the University of Washington, Ethan Cruz, which is showing a week of transit sped up into a minute. So you can see how often nature was winking at us, telling us that there were planets orbiting other stars, but from the ground, we just simply weren't sensitive. That's something which is a thread running through exoplanet history, I think, is that there are always more planets. Um, and that seems to be nature's rule. So here's an updated figure of that transit census that I showed you before that used to be only a few dozen planets. This is showing as of 2013, uh, again, so this figure's since been updated, the thousands of Kepler's transiting exoplanet candidates now, uh, candidates with, with very high fidelity. Um, and I want to draw your attention to a subset uh, here at the bottom, bottom part. So Jupiter transiting the sun would be fractionally that large in comparison, and it would reside about two-thirds of the way up that chart. So you get a sense immediately for the fact that most of the exoplanets that Kepler detected were orbiting stars smaller than the sun. And we uncovered that that's not only because they're relatively easier to detect, because the fractional size of that shadow projected against something smaller is larger. It's more detectable. It's not only that. It's that smaller stars host planets in greatest abundance. So I'm showing here the f this figure, which I think is one of the most exciting to come out of the Kepler mission at all. And it was about three years uh, into the lifetime of the mission that exoplanet folks first beheld <laughs> 
this figure uh, in scientific papers. And let me walk you through it. So the first thing to note is the x-axis, this is showing stellar effective temperature. So our own sun uh, at 5800 Kelvin is right about there. Stars extend to the right and to the left of this diagram, but Kepler didn't look at stars of every single stellar type. So the number of, pl of stars that went into calculating this plot at each of these stellar temperatures are shown there at the top. And you can see the largest bin is for those that are like the sun, and that's because Kepler had this science driver of establishing the number of planets, frequency of planets orbiting stars like the sun. But there's something very suggestive happening here, which is that uh, the number of planets per star interior to some orbital period, this was 50 days at the time, that's since been extended out to a year. Um, it seems to increase for smaller stars, and that's especially true for smaller planets. So the colors here are corresponding to th different sizes of planets. So Jupiter-sized things, about 10 times the size of the Earth, are shown with that blue line. And you can see that, indeed, this is what we were sensitive to prior to the launch of Kepler, transiting. It was this 0.01 Jupiter-sized planets per sun-like star. Look at all of the planets that remain to be discovered. And there was something that we might not have anticipated, um, which is that stars like the sun are actually not um, our best producers of small and potentially rocky planets. So at this time, things between two and four Earth radii were what got included on this plot. But with additional data, now we're down to things the size of the Earth. And indeed, they are more common, three times as common, uh, around small stars as they are around stars like the sun. And the reason why that's exciting for people who are interested in exoplanets is because these star small stars themselves are the most ubiquitous in the Milky Way galaxy. So this is a figure um, from Elizabeth Newton. She just earned her PhD uh, from Harvard University. And it's depicting the relative number of small stars per every sun-like star. What's remarkable about these small stars is that even though there are galaxies, silent majority, comprising something like 75, 80% of the stars in the Milky Way, you can't see a single one with your naked eye. Because, of course, human beings evolved to see the type of light which is emitted by our own host sun. These small stars glow much more dimly, and they glow with much redder light. If all of a sudden you were sensitive to that light, you would start to see a night sky which looks very different. Um, so this is showing, uh, again, a movie from Elizabeth Newton's public Harvard Horizons talk. Wish you could kind of see it better. You can sort of see that for every sun-like star, all of a sudden you can see seven or eight of these small red stars suddenly come into view if you had this lens where you were sensitive to the vast majority of stars in the Milky Way galaxy. So that's two things already which are pretty remarkable about the way that planets occur in nature. The first is that they are very common around small stars, that small stars themselves are very common. And what that means is that working backwards, you could try to figure out, well, how near must the nearest Earth-like planet be? By Earth-like now, I just mean in broad strokes. Something close to the size of the Earth and residing at such a distance from its host star that any water on the surface might be in its liquid form. That's a really broad stroke. People devote their whole PhDs and careers to thinking about that habitable zone. But in this, for the sake of just considering from the point of view taking something home, how close must that star be? So this is work from Georgia State. This is showing our neighborhood. So the star is off of our back porch. The sun is in the center. The radius of the sphere is about 10 parsecs, so like 30 light years. And this is showing all of our neighbors. It's color coded to show the temperature of the star. So cool stars are shown in red. You can see how prolific they are, even though we're not seeing any of them when we look out in the night sky. And Courtney Dressing, who's now a Carl Sagan fellow, like I was, um, at Caltech, calculated that with high confidence there must be an Earth-sized planet in the habitable zone of a small star within 18 light years. This is no longer all the way across our galaxy. This is right off our back stoop. Moreover, it must be one of these stars that we already know about. And as ground-based efforts are getting better and better, we're starting to find more and more of these small stars right off our back um, porch. So I like at this point, in public talks at least, I, I just never get tired of it, to use an analogy, which is that if the Milky Way galaxy uh, were the size of the United States, how far might we have to go? Here in Building 30, uh, or Building 1 um, on, the, on the Microsoft campus in Mountain View, California, how far would you have to go to get to the nearest Earth-sized planet, which resides in the habitable zone of its star, on which life might potentially have evolved? Would you have to go all the way across the nation? No, you would have to take one BART stop. <laughs> and that would be from um, Powell to Montgomery, I think is what I looked up. So you have to take her um, Embarcadero to 
Montgomery? I forget. I used to live in the Bay Area, so. Um, anyway, it's one BART stop, and I think that's just really a remarkable fact to digest that planets are ubiquitous and that they're nearby, um, and there's something crucial about that when it comes to potentially identifying life. So, um, uh, you know, we inferred this from knowledge about Kepler, which observed kind of this one cone as part of the sky. So everything I'm, t I'm saying about how the number of planets there must be in the Milky Way is inferred from this particular sample that Kepler looked at, which we then reverse engineered. How many planets must there then be for Kepler to have seen what it saw? That's something I'll revisit again. And the number is something like 100 billion or more planets must be in our Milky Way galaxy alone. So we're starting to fill in um, those numbers of the Drake equation, which I'm sure people are intimately familiar with at the SETI Institute. My advisor used to have this on his door um, even before, <laughs> even before uh, Kepler started finding all of these planets. Um, indeed, it's like they were right under our nose all along. <laughs> uh, so now I'll kind of return to the solar system and kind of give a sense for the science that can be eked out from huge, vast ensembles of exoplanets. So I am a very spoiled exoplanetary astrophysicist. I'm working with thousands of exoplanets, and I can start to make inferences about what a typical planetary system might look like in order for Kepler to have seen what it saw. And the best place, again, to start is in the solar system. So I'm showing here kind of a top-down view of our solar system. We're almost flat. So the highest degree of a mutual inclination between the orbits of any two planets in the solar system is seven degrees. That distribution peaks at around two degrees. So we are very flat indeed. Looking interior to the orbit of uh, Jupiter, this is showing to scale the orbits of the terrestrial planets. And now I'll show on the right just a subsample of Kepler's multi-transiting systems. So these are systems uh, in which there's not only one planet that's silhouetted against the host star, there's multiple planets. And you can see how tightly they are packed. That's telling us something, not only about nature's spacing of planets, but also their mutual inclination. Because if multiple planets transit, then they must align in such a way that they both are silhouetted against the face of the host star. This tells us something about their so-called mutual inclination. So now let's look at two case studies. The first on the left is the solar system, the stellar system, which is nearest and dearest to our own heart and then compare it to a typical system uncovered by Kepler uh, and a typical system indeed in our Milky Way galaxy, and this orbits a small star. And with broad strokes, they're actually not particularly dissimilar, um, other than the small star being about half the size of our own sun, this uh, so-called M dwarfs, half the size of the sun and smaller. It's cooler, this particular planet, by virtue of the fact that it has five distinct planets transiting against the face of a star, it must have at least five planets. We have to have at least eight. I put greater than or equal to, because it's unclear what is happening with planet nine. And at least greater than or, one or equal uh, to one of those resides in the star's habitable zone. I say that you know, with the approximate symbol for ourselves, because if we were aliens looking in on the solar system, we might say Venus has a good shot of being habitable. Um, and these are aligned uh, within eight degrees, uh, otherwise they would not all transit. Now I'm showing a top-down view of the habitable zone, which is shown here with this green glow. And you can see that because these small stars are so much less luminous than sun-like stars, potentially habitable planets reside much closer to the star. It's hard to remember every time all of the advantages that there are to studying planets around M-dwarfs, which is why I really started to get into that game uh, as a postdoc, which is that they're the most common type of star. They host the most small planets. They seem to host these small planets in architectures, which are really close, and when you see these planets which are closer in, they might still be habitable. Unlike for the solar system, when you find those relatively easier to find planets which are closer in, they probably don't host life, they're much too hot. So I got interested um, with a former uh, Yale graduate student, I've since brought him uh, to MIT to, uh, as a postdoc, to think about the typical planetary system that we have. So this is a top-down view produced by Jack Moriarty. And if you look at that system from the side, we can get a sense for how mutual inclination translates into what Kepler would have seen. So on the right-hand side now, I'm showing kind of the silicon eye of Kepler. If you have planets which are really closely aligned with one another, you're likelier to see more of them transit. So if you see one transit, you're likelier to see two transit, and so on. If they're a little dynamically hotter, which is to say if their mutual inclinations are, are a little more, then you're going to see less of them transit. And this is the single underlying principle 
behind uh, work that I did with John Johnson, uh, a professor at Harvard, a couple of years ago. This is the sum total of the data that we use for this study. And this is showing the number of small stars Kepler observed that host n transiting planets, where n runs from 1 to 5. So Kepler-186 is in this last bin, along with one other star, Kepler-32. So most of the stars, uh, the small stars that Kepler observed to have a transiting planet have only one. And that makes sense, because you would have to be very lucky indeed to see multiple transiting planets, let alone five. So we did this study where we had a toy model, and we imagined if you could carve two features into a stamp of a planetary system and then stamped it isotropically all over the sky, what would that stamp have to look like for Kepler to have seen what it saw? And we had two uh, characteristics that we assigned to those planetary systems. There were only two knobs that we could turn. The first was the number of planets per star and the scatter in their mutual inclination. And we have some reason to believe that different parts of this parameter space are actually, in truth, populated with planets. So the solar system is right about here. We have a lot of planets, and our mutual inclination uh, is quite low. You know, So we're actually up here. Um, but a very flat system, indeed, with six planets would be right there. In comparison, some of the hot Jupiter systems, especially work out of Caltech uh, and other places have demonstrated, they tend to have companions, too, but they're really highly mutually inclined. So these are systems in which there seem to be less planets, but perhaps something stirred them up. Perhaps they formed that way. In any case, much higher mutual inclinations. So we tried to take one stamp, carve it a bunch of different ways, and see what could we have expected Kepler to have detected if planets occurred the way that we imagine they do in this toy model. So now I'm showing the contours for that posterior distribution uh, at bottom. The first thing I want you to notice is on the top, there's no one model that predicts accurately Kepler's yield. This is the best model that we could get. It doesn't look necessarily physical. Uh, for reasons I can kind of address in the questions if folks are interested. But what's most compelling, I think, about this is it's just not providing a good fit. Like any one model really underpredicts the number of singly transiting planets and really overpredicts the number of multiply transiting planets. And this was not the first time that that idea was described in the literature. The so-called Kepler dichotomy was first described in 2011 or so, where there's starting to be this idea that one model even with some variability built into it, cannot reproduce what nature is making. Whereas if you have a mixture model, if you allow for two models, they're very well separated in parameter space. You have the first population, uh, which looks like the solar system, in which the solar system resides, at least in terms of number of planets and their mutual inclination. And then you have the second population, where either a lot less planets are being made, or they're being made at really high mutual inclinations with, with respect to one another. Or perhaps it started out in some fashion, something got disrupted, some of the planets might have met their end in some way onto the host star, accreted onto other planets. So there's a number of hypotheses as to what uh, gives rise to the so-called Kepler dichotomy, but the fact is it's observationally, um, in, uh, what's the word, in, um, disputable? Indisputable. Um, and moreover, at least in this first population, this range of mutual inclinations is consistent with what we already know. So based on the transit duration, which is the amount of time it takes that planet to sweep across the face of the host star, you can imagine if you have multiple planets transiting, that's probing the cord across which the planet is sweeping. Because if you're close to the limb of the star, that transit duration is much shorter. So you can get from ratios of transit durations to how tightly mutually inclined the planets are. So this particular population is consistent um, with work from other authors. So I used to title talks about this particular result, Choose Your Own Adventure. Uh, and that's if you were a child in the 90s, then you probably like perked up. Um, and uh, that's for the following reason. So I'm showing here now the, um, the marginalized posterior distributions for the three parameters we varied. The first was that mutual inclination peaks around 2 degrees, at least for this system. You need at least five planets per star for small stars, and this type of mode, where you have flat manifold architectures, happens 50% of the time, hence the so-called choose your own adventure. And the other half of the time, something else is happening altogether. Uh, and it's that 50% number in more recent work we found is actually a function of stellar type, uh, moreover. And so I got really interested with Jack in investigating what might give rise to the Kepler dichotomy. And let me describe why that is a really crucial piece of information to know when it comes to thinking about habitability of planets. 
So you might imagine uh, that if you had some set of planets, they formed uh, in a planetesimal disk, which is what I'm showing you here, um, hunks of rock, which are the size of asteroids, up to things the size of the moon, this so-called late-stage planet formation. And you ran it forward in time using an n-body simulator, like Jack did. You can observe what the resulting planetary system might have looked like. And moreover, you can continue integrating it forward in time to see whether that planetary configuration is stable. You might imagine if there's an hourglass on planetary systems formed around average stars, that if they tend to disrupt themselves because of the planets tugging on one another over a time scale of a billion years, surely you would look today and you would see that half of them are no longer in that primordial configuration. And you would say to yourself, that is very worrisome because that means that the time scale for dynamical stability around an average star for an average planet is shorter than an evolutionary time scale. So that even if life managed to evolve on one of those planets, wouldn't that be a shame if that was what uh, the experiment that nature was running? That around an average star, that you would not last very long, and you would expect half of them to have be disrupted if that time scale were giga years, which is what some scientists have found. But what Jack and I found was actually distinct. This is a very kind of active field right now in exoplanets, whether or not the Kepler dichotomy is frozen in at formation, or whether dynamical stability stirs up planets over time scales, and that has very important, profound conclusions for how often my life might evolve. So what we found is that two types of disks actually create the Kepler dichotomy. So it's actually formation condition that determines the type of planetary system that results, and once it forms, it's stable for long periods of time. So rather than saying there's this hourglass, we actually think it's manufactured by variety in nature among the primordial type of planetary disk. And these are described with two types of disks. Uh, one that originates things that look more like the solar system, and one which is flatter in which there's less mass. So that was kind of our uh, investigation. We're continuing to do this. What we find is that this particular model, a combination of these two disks, when we evolve them forward in time, we can get at not only the number of transiting planets that should result if disks form the way that they do, and then we allow them to accrete planets over time and we observe them, we can also get at synthetic transit distribution, transit uh, duration distributions. We can get at the uh, spacing between planets. What are the periods of planets that we should see? And all of these things are consistent with this mixture model produced by these kinds of disks. So now I'll move on from ensemble studies of planets to a single world for a little while to describe why it's so worthwhile to anchor, at least judiciously, some observational resources in really understanding single planets. And again, we'll start in the solar system. This is one of my favorite results in exoplanetary science in the past five years, and it's not even about an exoplanet. It's just extremely relevant to exoplanets. It's about Saturn's moon, Titan. This was a study that was done with Cassini, a uh, spacecraft which produced those beautiful images of Saturn's rings that you might have seen this particular image, um, they were doing a different study altogether of Titan. What you can see is that they aligned the Cassini spacecraft so that sunlight was filtering through the upper atmosphere of uh, that wraith-like uh, ring around Titan. And what they did is they aligned the spacecraft so that it was sort of dragged through different layers of that atmosphere. And what they're doing is seeing what colors of light make it through the atmosphere. So based on the constituent molecules in an atmosphere, those molecules are going to preferentially suck up photons, different colors of light, corresponding to the transitions between that individual molecule. So you can get at, based on which colors of light are permitted to go through the atmosphere and which are blocked, the constituent species of molecule in that atmosphere. So-called remotely detecting what's um, What's present in atmospheres is our only hope at present, at least in my lifetime, um, for understanding what might be in exoplanet atmospheres because we can't go. But we did with Titan. So this is a key study to figure out whether this particular method that we have for remotely inferring the molecules in worlds which are light years away works in situ. Uh, and this is one of my favorite figures <laughs> for, um, in exoplanetary science, even though it's about a moon. Uh, in our own solar system. So what we're showing here is the relative size of the planet as a function of wavelength. So you can imagine if you had a particular planet and it was only rock, 
rock is an equal opportunity ab absorber of photons. So at any wavelength that you observe the planet to go in front of the host star or to block starlight, it doesn't care what wavelength of light is imp impinging upon it. It's going to block anything. If you have an envelope of air or gas on top of it, uh, at wavelengths where the atmosphere is so-called optically thin, which is to say where the atmosphere is transparent to that color of light, the planet will appear physically smaller. And if you're looking at a wavelength at which the atmosphere is optically thick or it's opaque to that color of photon, the planet's going to look physically larger. So this is what's underlying the study, uh, the so-called transmission spectroscopy studies of exoplanets, and we did it with a moon. And moreover, you see not only these beautiful ringing methane features, but you also see that there's this underlying power law, which is telling us about the average particulate size in Titan's atmosphere, what the dust is like. And part of the reason why I love this study is because we know from the Huygens probe that plummeted to the surface of Titan exactly what that atmosphere is made of. That probe tasted the particulate sizes. It can confirm that what we infer from this power law is correct. It, in fact, was in the atmosphere. The sizes of these features are telling you how strongly the planet is tugging on the atmosphere. So larger features correspond to a more extended atmosphere because it's being tugged on less um, gravitationally by the planet itself. And we know from the speed at which Huygens plummeted to the surface of Titan how strong that surface gravity would be, and it matches with the size of these features. So this is one of my favorite studies because it shows if it works in the solar system, it can work across the galaxy. And this is the hope that we have for other planets. So I'm showing here a, a transmission spectrum um, of GJ1214. Um, so this is what used to be one of the closest planets. It orbits an M dwarf. It was uncovered not actually by the Kepler Observatory, but by the Mirth Observatory. This was a mission, um, this was a, a, a project which started in 2008 or so, and it was taking advantage of one fact, which is that what you can't do from the ground for sun-like stars, you can do from the ground for small stars, because really large stars like our sun, an Earth-sized planet passing in front of it is going to block 70 photons out of every million. That's very, very hard to detect from the ground, where the atmosphere is bothering you, where you can only look 12 hours a day, and so on. Around small stars, that signature is larger. And moreover, if you see something closer in, you also know that it's cooler. So this is something about two and a half times the size of the Earth. And what you can see is something that would cause despair uh, in many folks who study atmospheres, which is that it looks like it's really flat. So this is the exact same axis as it showed on that figure with Titan, the relative size of the planet as a function of wavelength. These are models produced by uh, Eliza Kempton, a professor at Grinnell. And you can see that there's various predictions here that are shown in colors for what the atmosphere, how the planet's size should appear to vary if there's a lot of atmosphere, uh, if there's methane, if there's water. And this planet is not giving up its secrets. There's either a very um, heavy layer of clouds, a high altitude haze, and that means that we may never know what's in the atmosphere of GJ 1213. If uh, 1214. If that's the case for many exoplanets, that would be a shame because we have this great method that works, but if clouds and high altitude hazes are common, that um, knowledge will forever be a mystery to us until we can actually go. Um, and that won't happen when I'm hopefully ever a professor. Um, I will no longer be of this earth, as they say, when we actually go uh, to these other planets. So if I hope to ever know, then things have to um, be different. They would have to be clear atmospheres and so on. And that, which is why I felt such hope seeing that transmission spectrum of Titan, because that means there are planets out there where we can infer so much, even remotely, and we know that it must be true, even though we never got to go. And the reason why I feel so strongly about that is because that's our one hope for remotely detecting the existence of life. So just this past weekend, my family and I went to Jackson Hole in Wyoming. If you've ever been there, you know that it's uh, geothermally very active. In fact, we visited a place called the Grand Prismatic Spring in which microbial mats um, provide this brilliant color gradient. Um, and we think that even if life on another planet only resided in the form of microbial mats, like the ones my, me and my family saw at the Grand Prismatic Springs, you still could know that there was life on that planet, even if it hadn't evolved to the point of being able to craft a telescope, point that telescope at you, and beam prime numbers at you. You still could know that it was there, because life interacts with the atmosphere of its planet in a way in which one can infer, even remotely, that life must be present. 
That's something we can do uh, with our own planet too. We can look at our atmosphere and say, there must be life there. It looks like there's only bacteria living here, more or less. Uh, and that's because those things are imprinting upon the atmosphere extremely strongly in a way that you might be able to detect even if you could never go. And um, what I'm showing here, this is not a real spectrum. This is the spectrum of my wildest dreams and the type of spectrum that might indeed be on the front page of the Chronicle in N years, where I'll get to that at the end. Uh, and what you can see here, it's the exact same axes as before. This is with uh, the James Webb Space Telescope, looking for 30 hours at a particular planet, and it's looking at the relative size of the planet as a function of wavelength, and these features are encoding the existence of CO2 and water in the atmosphere. That's gonna be a tough business saying conclusively that there must be life which produces the signatures that we see, but boy, I can't wait for that game to start. Um, and let me describe to you what it's gonna look like on telescope panels for James Webb when astronomers start thinking about who is gonna get the time to look at these particular planets. 30 hours is actually not that long to use a telescope. Like this, this is a cheap planet, relatively speaking. In order to eke out with a signal to noise of 15 or so, so you're confident, you know, 15 to one, that what you've seen is an atmospheric feature. For an average small star, small star, now those are the most advantageous nearby, you need about 200 hours of time with James Webb. That might not sound like that long, but you have to remember we can only gather those observations when the planet is in transit because that's the only time that those precious photons are passing through the atmosphere of that planet, producing that silhouetted ring against the planet in which we can detect signatures of different molecules. So even for close-in planets that transit often, you're looking at five-year baseline. So we're gonna be three years in before we even have a sense for this planet is cloudy, which is why my current work at MIT is sort of based on what are cheap observables that we can get ahead of time to kind of give ourselves the best possible chance um, identifying ahead of time, this planet is likelier to have clouds. This planet is likelier to potentially be habitable. And the Kepler dichotomy is only one feature of that. I would say, if there's two transiting planets, great. I would put all my money in that basket because that means that that planetary system is dynamically cooler, probably those orbits are more circular, and so on. And you might wonder at this point, well, ha why haven't we started these observations yet? Must we wait for James Webb? And the answer is we don't even really know where those planets are yet. So when I describe the Kepler mission, there's a reason why you don't see, if you're interested in exoplanets, very many transmission spectra of Kepler planets, and it's because that mission was designed for an entirely separate purpose. It's a mission that's statistical in nature. It's looking at things which are hundreds of light years away. They're way outside of that sphere I showed of our nearest neighbors. There's almost none of the Kepler planets which are suitable to follow-up atmosphere observation because they're just too far away and they're too dim. They were great for the Kepler mission, but they're poor when it comes to following up and trying to understand something about exoplanet atmospheres. The mission that's gonna find the nearby planets is called TESS. It has a completely separate observational strategy. This is a mission run out of MIT, actually. You can see why a young person interested in exoplanets would love to be at MIT right now. Um, and it has a, an observational strategy distinct from Kepler. Rather than affixing its gaze to one part of the, of the sky and not moving except to downlink the data back to Earth for four years, TESS has a stair and step strategy. It has four cameras on board. And moreover, it's not in an Earth trailing orbit. It's actually in two to one resonance with the moon. So it's sweeping in the same um, distance from Earth as the moon. And every time it sweeps by the moon, it can downlink all of that data. So that's great, we no longer have to be so choosy about our targets like we were with Kepler. We're gonna be looking at all of the nearby stars, all of the M dwarfs within 50 parsecs are gonna get time with TESS, but you can see that you can't actually look that long if you have to move those four cameras every 27 days, uh, which is the number of days that TESS um, spends on any given stellar field. So if that's the case, um, we are gonna be finding so many more habitable planets around small stars because in 27 days, your ability to find a planet signal is limited to things which are very close in, and the close in things which might potentially be the right temperature for life are all gonna be around dim stars. So when it comes to the James Webb space targets, I predict that the vast, vast majority of these will be detected by TESS, which is launching on a SpaceX rocket um, next December uh, as the current um, uh, launch date, so you can imagine uh, that I eagerly watch every SpaceX launch, um, and if you watch the one this week, you can probably imagine the relief and excitement that people who are interested in exoplanets feel every time SpaceX really uh, sticks the landing.
So uh, this is a figure just to give kind of a sense for why we have this relative paucity of planets that are really tasty for follow-up atmosphere observations. So this is showing um, from a concept study report from the Transiting Exoplanet Survey Satellite, or TESS, um, the types of planets that are good for follow-up. So there's really three things that go into a recipe for a planet that's really great for atmospheric follow-up. The first is that that star is really bright. So there's almost no uh, stars right now where you can take your niece or nephew or your child and point up in the sky and say, that star you can see with your naked eye hosts a planet. There's almost none like that, um, or hosts a small planet. You know, there's a, there's a handful because you can't see, I think, a single one of the Kepler stars with your naked eye. Uh, you want that star to be very, very bright, even visible to the naked eye, which are very bright stars indeed, because that means you have relative wealth of photons racing towards you from that planet, passing through its atmosphere. You want that planet to be rocky. We didn't used to know what that meant. Maybe there are things which are three times the extent of the Earth, which are actually rocky. Is that possible? Uh, and it turns out that nature doesn't really make planets like that. Things which are 60% larger than Earth or smaller tend to be terrestrial. And we don't have anything like the solar system like that. We are the largest of the terrestrial planets, and then we jump to Neptune. And these things which are in between the size of Earth and Neptune are actually 80% of the planets in the Milky Way and 0% of, of the planets in the solar system. That's only one way in which exoplanets are really a unique laboratory for understanding planetary science. Now we know that break happens at about 60% larger than Earth. You want that thing to be rocky because we don't really know how life evolves, but we imagine um, that it requires a murky puddle to get started. And if you want a murky puddle, you need at least two things. The first is you need liquid water, and you need a surface. So uh, in order to be rocky, smaller than uh, 1, 1 1.6 Earth radii or so, and you want that to be orbiting a small star, so that in the lifespan of James Webb, you have a fighting chance of getting you know, even a 10 to 1 signature of an atmospheric feature that might correspond to life. There's this little golden part of parameter space where you have the right stellar type for follow-up, where it's really bright and it hosts a small planet, and where Kepler has found none of these planets, Tess will find dozens. And these are going to be the planets that will ultimately be following up, that will ultimately be, I think, the one that appears on the front page of the San Francisco Chronicle. So let me answer these questions. First, how common are exoplanets, and are most of the planets in the Milky Way orbiting stars like the Sun? The answer is they're extremely common. You can't swing a purse without hitting an exoplanet. And um, most of the planets in the Milky Way, by virtue of the fact that most of the stars in the Milky Way are not like the sun, orbit stars different than the sun. And most of the small planets also are orbiting small stars, not stars like the sun. Can one solar system-like model explain what we've seen from exoplanet search efforts? No. You need a mixture model. I haven't shown you results that Jack and I have worked on more recently, which have to do with, well, what does that dichotomy breakdown look like for sun-like stars? Is it the case that all stars orbiting, uh, all planets orbiting stars like the sun actually do look like solar system on type ensembles? The answer to that is no. Instead of it being a 50-50 choose your own adventure, it's more like 20%. There seems to be so much um, diversity and complexity in planet occurrence, which is why I like to use this judicious combination of the wide field lens for ensemble studies and also the microscope to understand individual planets. Is it possible to remotely detect signatures of other atmospheres? How do we know this method works? Yes, and because we did it with Titan, and it really worked, because we actually went. And when will I see the detection of a molecule of another Earth? On the front page of the San Francisco Chronicle, let me take a guess. So my best guess is that TESS will be launched December of 2017. So let's say that there's a few months pushback. Uh, we get pushed to the next SpaceX rocket. Who knows? OK, so now you're in early 2018. The test starts taking data immediately. You have dozens of people in exoplanets, especially young people, digging through that data looking for the planets. I think that planet will be discovered in 2018. It'll appear in the Astrophysical Journal or Nature, you know, and astronomers will get excited. And then members of the public are waiting for that atmospheric detection, though. I feel like there's kind of a saturation among folks who are interested in science generally with planet discoveries. <laughs> We've had a lot of them, um, so it doesn't really get your heart racing like maybe it did in 1985. Um, so we'll find that planet in 2018. James Webb will launch, and it'll start that follow-up effort. 
So I'm being optimistic, and I'm saying it will take five years <laughs> for James Webb, or four years or so, to apply for that star time. Astronomers will squabble amongst themselves about which is the planet which is deserving of the follow-up um, endeavor for which we'll only know two or three years in whether that planet is just covered in a haze that is gonna prevent us from ever learning more about it. Then James Webb will look. It will start accruing transit observations. Every transit, let's say it happens every 30 days for this habitable small planet. It can happen every 30 days because that close into a small star is still nice and warm, room temperature. And my guess is maybe a young scientist, that person would just now, he or she would just be now finishing high school if they were going to be a postdoc at the time that they published the study uh, on the James Webb Space Telescope transmission spectrum of an Earth-sized habitable planet uncovered with TESS. So that person um, is probably just now 18. And um, they'll lead that investigation. Someone's going to pick up on it. I predict it'll be 2022. Um, so save the date. <laughs> Uh, and thank you for your attention. <laughs> All right, I'm just going to ask the first question, but put your hands up if you'd like to ask Sarah any questions. So Sarah, um, uh, you said that the Titan observations give you confidence that this method yeah, yeah, will work yeah, out. Yeah, 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 they did. How likely is it, or how useful is Titan as uh, an hour of what you want? Right. Mm -hmm. I mean, isn't, isn't cl aren't clouds going to come along with life? Aren't clouds going to be associated with water on the surface? Mm -hmm. Aren't we going to hope for clouds in a, in a lifelike planet? But Titan is not lifelike. And yeah. so that, that lack of clouds that helps out, helps out our observations of yeah. Titan is gonna, not going to work well with habitable type planets. Uh, so that's a good thoughts? question. So one of my favorite results was actually put out by David Singh earlier last year. So it actually showed that flatness is not the rule. So flatness is what you really dread. You can still get features with patchy cloud coverage. In fact, we get it with hot Jupiters. I mean, ba they're basically nothing but atmosphere. They're covered in clouds. And yet we still can eke out something about their molecular content. Um, and that particular haze power law seems to change. It seems to change in some mysterious way with the strength of the water feature. A in any case, you can have clouds and still see something. I've been skipping over a lot because I'm uh, very partial to transits because my career, such as it is, was made on transit observations. But when I think about what's actually going to be the thing that gets people most excited, it's so far in the future, and it's different than transits. It's direct imaging. So what you really want to do is take a picture of the planet, and you don't want to have that degeneracy of interpretation that you have from a transmission spectrum where you're like, shoot, it's flat. Now what am I going to do? You know, or like, is this feature, could this feature be methane? Is it possibly CO? You know, and so there will be like a lot of discussion of that, rigorous discussion as there ought to be. With, a, with an image of a planet where you could actually lay down a slit on top of that planet and get its emergent spectrum, that's what you really want to do. And there was a chance to do that, actually. So there's another way in which that was just like independently confirmed. And that was with the epoxy mission. Uh, this is my very first NASA mission. So of, close it, of course, it's near and dear to my heart. When it wasn't looking at uh, stars which we knew host planets, it turned and observed the Earth. So it observed Earth rotating. And you can imagine taking that data, reducing it down to a single pixel, which is what you would have if you had a directly imaged uh, planet and seeing whether you could eke out what's on the surface of the Earth. Could you make an orange slice model in which you're not going to be able to tell, you know, where the continents start and stop, but you can at least say, if this planet is made out of two colors, what are the colors? What does it look like uh, just longitudinally? And sure enough, work, um, astronomers led by Nick Cowan, a graduate student at the time, showed that you can pretty much describe Earth as two colors, a reddish brown and a blue. And when you look at the Earth, there is a big reddish-brown slice where Europe and Africa are. And then there's another kind of reddish-brown slice where North and South America are, and the rest is blue. And that's the kind of thing, a so-called phase curve from direct image observations that doesn't depend on clouds at all. Um, and that's not my uh, specialty, you know, which is why I'm like, oh, transits are where it's at. But when I think about the future, like, ultimately, if I get the chance to advise students, like, like he or she will lead a PhD thesis on, like, direct imaging. Um, and that's like clouds or no, we can do great stuff with that. So speaking of clouds, yeah. well, first I'll say I was I you know been following exoplanets since 
you know, 51 Pegasi. Uh, and I was excited this morning about four new planet system that K2 found, which yeah. is really, really cool. <laughs> right. um, but my question is not about that. Um, we're a weird <laughs> solar system for population one in that even for larger stars, we don't have anything inside the orbit of Mercury. So a lot of the stars that you're going to be looking at with mm -hmm. planets, the Tess or whoever finds, or maybe K2 finds, you know, mm -hmm. who knows, mm -hmm. um, the planets are going to be really close in mm -hmm. that you're looking at and Indeed. maybe tidally locked or in resonance with each other, with the star, whatever. Indeed. A, a, assuming you find an Earth-like planet, not just Earth-sized, in yeah. that setting, what's that yeah. the atmosphere going to be like and how is that going to affect your observations? Because right. that's not going to look like anything in our solar system. No, it won't. And that's a key question because I'm describing rolling the dice on planets which are necessarily dissimilar to Earth. So there's something I've skipped over, which is that Spin synchronization, um, so tidal locking is what has happened with the moon and the earth, where you actually have the same side of the body like glued toward the same side uh, of the earth, in our case with the moon, but with a planet, you're close enough in where there's never day and night transition. You have permanent day and permanent night. You can also have synchronous rotation, where you have some kind of, um, you know, you have like two days a year or something, which is, I think, what Mercury has. Uh, Mercury's like a three-two. Three-two? Okay, so... Um, Inside the habitable zone of a small star, spin synchronization has almost certainly occurred. Um, so if that's the case, how could life evolve on a world like that? So the first crucial thing is, how could the atmosphere even be stable? And Kevin Hang really, uh, I think, is a leader in that particular field. So in, in 2012, he published this paper that was just, with the broadest strokes, what's the time scale? There's two relevant time scales. The first is, how quickly is the atmosphere radiating away heat? The other is, how quickly can you move parcels of air from one side of the planet to the other? So that depends very sensitively on the constituent particles in the atmosphere. So if you have something which is relatively light and easy to move, like hydrogen, you can move that hot air over to the night side and keep the atmosphere stable, uh, and that would be fine. Okay, so uh, I'm not even talking about like where would life evolve? Could life evolve under like the burning Sauron like gaze of a star that like never flinches? Like maybe it could evolve on the Terminator. Or I mean, I'm not even going there. I'm just saying like, is the atmosphere stable? And there's a really sensitive trade off there with whether tidal locking or spin synchronization has occurred, and if so, how it's occurred, and what exactly the constituent atmosphere is made of. Um, and that is that is a tricky question. I ache to even try, you know. Um, but the first question is, is it possible to even have a stable atmosphere? And the answer is yes. Um, maybe this, this is a question about, about the, uh, the SETI implications of the particular uh, technique being used. Yeah. Uh, going back to the, to the dressing, it's about mutual detection. Uh, going back to, the, I think, the dressing uh, uh, illustration, mm -hmm. where it went out about 18 or 20, 20 light years or so. Yeah. And if, if sort of they were using the say if if what we've seen are using the same techniques as we are, say transit, where mm -hmm. there is this limitation mm -hmm. on on on, on uh, shadowing, mm -hmm. uh, could any of those of them using the same technology or generalizing to an ensemble of technology techniques, yeah. not just technologies, could could they see us as well? Yeah. Um, so there's another kind of secret ace we have up our sleeve. Um, which has to do with the timing of transits. So for example, if we were aliens and we were looking in and we were at such an angle where Earth transited but not Jupiter, we still would know Jupiter was there because it's tugging on the Earth. So I've described you know, stars tugging on planets, um, but planets also tug on each other. I've talked about that in terms of long-term dynamical instability, but you can have stable situations in which planets are tugging on one another. In fact, that's how fully half of planets smaller than two times radius of the Earth have had their masses measured now, because it's planets tugging on each other, and then you see that the transits don't occur at clock -like, clock, um, exactly like clockwork, uh, as they should. Rather, they appear early or late, depending on how massive the thing is that's tugging on them. So if you were looking at Earth, the largest effect would be due to Jupiter, and you would infer there is something else in the system which is probably Jupiter-sized. We would have some understanding of like where it is. We would guess that it's probably where Jupiter is, or, and then maybe it could be further, maybe. Anyway, and you would start to build up an understanding based on both the tr timing of the transits and the radial velocity signature. So even if the thing doesn't transit, you can still look at the reflex motion that planets gravitationally induce on their host star. It's a very complicated signal to untangle, but it doesn't have to be transiting. 
Yeah, yeah. So there's some degeneracy of interpretation because you don't know exactly where the planet is that's tugging on the star. Um, so transits are great for that. And you can't do atmospheric follow-up uh, unless the planet's transiting. But if you're talking about finding a single planet and then trying to uncover more, a more complete picture of its architecture, we have a few secret techniques, which are transit timing variations and then following up with radial velocities. Yeah, I was curious. Um, you mentioned that my, pr microbial life interacts with the atmosphere of um, a planet to cause some sort of specific signature. Yeah. And I'm wondering if you could tell me a little bit more about that uh, sure. signature and that variance, and also what kind of microbial life you're talking about. Uh, indeed. Um, I got so excited when I was in graduate school about like the putative detection of arsenic-based life in Mono Lake. Like I got so into that, and I think that's since um, been refuted, I, ca I can't remember, but um, it certainly does seem like on Earth anyway, we've evolved a very particular type of way um, to live and trees use it, microbes use it and humans use it. Um, and it's hard to say whether um, the evolution that produced those models necessarily would take place in the same way and I suspect almost certainly not, like on another planet. So how would you even know that there was life? And moreover, there's some degeneracy of interpretation as you're, as you're saying. So there's like a balance in our own atmosphere um, between ozone and CO2 fudge. I like usually turn to my um, friend, one of my best friends, who does um, astrobiology, theoretical astrobiology. There is one particular mo mo molecule on planet Earth, which is nitrous oxide, um, laughing gas, which is actually only produced by bacteria. So if we saw that, and like we don't know of an, abio of a, of an abiotic way of producing nitrous oxide, actually, so, um, which doesn't mean it doesn't exist. But if I saw that, then I would, you know, fractionally speaking, just giving a broad sense, I would be like, wow, that's probably really worth investigating more. Um, of course, what everyone would really like is just like a signal, you know, like, hello. Um, and that's saying not only that there's life, but that it's intelligent. But then trying to ask a bacteria, like, are you alive or not? You know, hello, um, hundreds of light years away. There are ways of doing it, but I suspect there won't be an easy answer and that it'll come out on the front page of the Chronicle or something, and then scientists are going to debate it for probably decades. Um, and I wish it was an easier picture where it'd be like, we found life. But I think like most scientific advances, um, it'll be uh, digested and metabolized by people for many years and argued about like any good scientific thing should be. Uh, Sarah? Yeah. Um, when you're looking at for transits, don't you have to be incredibly lucky to be looking onto the plane of the rotations? And so mm -hmm. what, what percentage of um, solar systems do you get to see transits? Depends on exactly where the planet is. So it scales as the number of stellar radii away that the planet is parked. For, so for, for hot Jupiters, the so-called hot Jupiters, the first that we found, they're so close, they're actually only 10 times the stellar radius itself away from the star. And that's a 10% transit probability. Um, so if you looked at 10 and you saw one transit, you would infer there's a 100% occurrence. Because in order for me to have seen one out of 10, there would have to be one out of every star. Now, for Earth, I think it's more like 1 in 30,000 or something. I forget what the ex actual number is. So, like, when people are producing or designing the surveys, they use that statistics and they take that into account. How many stars would I have to look at? If the occurrence rate is 100%, I'll have to look at 30,000 to see, to be lucky enough to see one transit, and then I have to make sure my instrument is sensitive enough so that when I see that one transit, I can distinguish it from noise. And those are the two things um, which are at the center of like most calculations for, for planet discovery with the transit method. Um, and that, and sure enough, like with hot Jupiters, uh, we had to look at a thousand, I think, to find one. Uh, is that correct? Yes, because um, out of that thousand, ten transit, ten have a hot Jupiter. Um, there's a one percent occurrence rate. So if you look at one thousand sun-like stars. 10 will have a hot Jupiter, one of them for the hot Jupiter will transit. So that's how we knew there was a 1% occurrence rate because we looked at 1,000 and saw one. So it's like a, cal a subtle calculus that involves being able to detect the thing and then how far away it is from the star. We have the last question here, and if you have any more questions, you can come up and uh, see Sarah later. Hi, thanks for this amazing talk. Um, I have a question about the uh, habitable zone. Um, so we base our definition on uh, the region where uh, water, uh, liquid water could exist, right? So don't you think this definition should be extended in a way, uh, since we discovered other bodies outside the our habitable zone w where uh, liquid water is uh, possible, right? Yeah. I mean, you're speaking to something 
uh, that's kind of unspoken, like in a lot of studies about exoplanets, which is that we're kind of looking for life that is like us. You know, like Carl Sagan posited sentient octopi in the atmosphere of Jupiter. Um, and how, but how would you ever detect that? You know, like so there's a thread running through all of these conversations, which is hardly ever directly acknowledged, which is we're really focusing on things we could detect and recognize. And there's a sh that's a shame. I, I want to say we have to start somewhere. And I hate that that's the answer. I, I really think that it is. But even within that definition, I think that Earth provides ample examples, even in our own backyard, for how life can thrive in a variety of circumstances that look very dire indeed. You know, like there's bacteria even under the rocks in the Atacama Desert where it hasn't rained in decades. And um, those bacteria get their water from the tiny amount of water which is present in, the atmosp in atmospheric vapor. You know, so when I, or there's life at the bottom of the ocean, you know, that life has never seen a photon, uh, you know, from the sun. Um, so, and there might be life, you know, under the shelves of Enceladus and me. So, um, you know, but when it comes to the murky puddle or whatever, uh, you know, it's really hard to be a human being and like extract yourself from that narrative, which we think gave life, gave rise to life on earth. And it's hard to think like an alien, you know, I, I urge you to do that. I'll conclude there. <laughs> All right, <coughs> ladies and gentlemen, if you're um, just to let you know, next week we have a talk from Frank Shu. He's going to talk about nuclear power uh, and uh, bring it to Mars. It's a very popular talk. So if you haven't booked already on Eventbrite, do so now. We already have over 100 subscribers for that one. And then uh, if you're interested in finding out a little bit more about uh, the uh, signal that we got from uh, the uh, Tabby Star, uh, we're going to have one of the Chief Protagonist, Jason Wright, speaking on August the 9th. So that'll again be a very popular one. Um, and uh, for today's fabulous speaker, Sarah, we have uh, this special Seti mug. Thank you so it's, much. Uh, it's got these <laughs> robots on it. Now I'm sure that they're, they evolved on an M-Dwarf, I'm sure. Yes. Please join me in thanking Sarah for a great talk.